Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today for the beginning, the kickoff of our spring series on Evolution Matters. And before introducing Scott, I just want to say a brief word about how we selected the speakers. Um, as you probably know, there's a great new exhibit upstairs on evolution on islands. It, the, the museum staff did a wonderful job putting it together. And if you haven't seen that exhibit, you really must get up there and see it. But one thing you'll see if you go to the, that exhibit is that Islands have this incredible bonanza of evolutionary wealth of plants and animals, and that we have used them to study evolution in many different ways. And so we chose our speakers to illustrate the great diversity of islands and how they've helped shape our knowledge of evolutionary biology. And so we have people working in the Hawaiian Islands, in the southern continents, in the Galapagos, and studying evolution in very different ways, from studying how natural selection works to how the deep evolutionary history. And so it's really a spectacular series of talks that we're going to have over the next seven weeks, I think, pretty much one every other week. And I really urge you to come back for all of them. It should be a wonderful, a wonderful set of talks. But having said that, it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Scott Edwards, my colleague and dear friend. Now, as many of you know, Scott is one of the world's leading authorities on evolutionary biology, so it's a great pleasure, a great treat to have him speak to us tonight. Those of us who knew, who knew Scott way back when are not at all surprised by his prominence. I remember very well the first time I became aware of Scott. It was pretty much exactly 30 years ago. At that time, I was a graduate student at the University of California, Berkeley. And there we had a weekly seminar, spirit, uh, seminar series in which distinguished luminaries in the field, either passing through town or from the Berkeley faculty, would come to address us on their research. Well, one, one week we learned that the speaker would be not some distinguished luminary, but rather an undergraduate. <laughs> an undergraduate! We couldn't believe it. Well, as you may have guessed, that undergraduate was none other than Scott. He was there visiting Berkeley as a prospective graduate student, and he was lectured to us on his undergraduate honors research on the evolutionary relationships of African mole rats. And I can tell you, we were blown away. It was one of the most spectacular talks uh, that any of us could remember. Now, not surprisingly, Scott was admitted to the graduate program, <laughs> and he came and he did his PhD at Berkeley, where he studied the DNA evolution of a type of Australian bird, the social babbler. Now, I should back up and say that that was not the first place to which Scott followed me. Sorry to make this a little bit about me, but I've sort of led the way for Scott. Um, I was actually an undergraduate here, and a year later, Scott matriculated as well. Now, we didn't actually meet as undergraduates, uh, perhaps because I was in Adam's house and he was in Quincy house, but I learned just today that Scott uh, imitated me in another way. We both received C's in organic chemistry. <laughs> Uh, finally, Scott uh, followed me in one last way, although in this way he didn't quite get it right. Uh, in 1992, I took up my first faculty position at Washington University in St. Louis. Three years later, in 1995, Scott took his first faculty position, not at Wash U, but at the University of Washington. <laughs> so Scott was there from 1995 to 2003 before we switched roles, and Scott led the way by coming here to Harvard as a faculty member. Ever since then, he has been the curator of ornithology at the Museum of Comparative Zoology, as well as the Alexander Agassi Professor in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology. Now, uh, as his undergraduate and graduate projects suggest, Scott has always been interested in using genetic tools to both understand how evolution works and to decipher evolutionary history. Scott has indeed been a trailblazer using the latest, of, uh, the latest molecular methods to study evolution, most recently by studying entire genomes, as we'll hear about tonight, as well as developing new conceptual frameworks to understand how evolution works. Uh, for these advances, Scott has deservedly garnered many accolades and awards, including being elected president of the American Genetics Association, president of the Society for the Study of Systematic Biology, and president of the Society for the Study of Evolution. In addition, just last year, Scott was, was elected as a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences. And finally, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't introduce him without mentioning that he is also a star of stage and screen, having been one of the principals in the Sci-Fi Channel's 2010 series, Beast Legends. <laughs> and you must, I don't know if those are available on YouTube, but uh, <laughs> you really should look them up. 
All right, from my recounting of Scott's research, you may have the impression that he is a laboratory scientist, comfortable only in an indoor setting wearing a white lab coat. But that could not be further from the truth. In fact, Scott has conducted field work around the world in places as far flung as Mongolia, Nova Scotia, and the Harvard Forest. And most notably, many of his field sites have been on islands. He's done research in Papua New Guinea, in the Hawaiian Islands, and Australia. And that, of course, brings us to tonight's topic, evolution and conservation of island birds, lessons from genomics. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce Scott Edwards. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Jane. I, I told Jonathan not to mention that C in organic chemistry, but <laughs> some, sometimes it just gets away with them. It's a pleasure to be here and to open up our series. It's wonderful to see uh, some old friends. Uh, family is here as well. I see some folks from my freshman seminar last fall. I think there's probably some folks from ornithology class here as well, as well as my lab. And so thanks, everyone, for coming. It's uh, hopefully it'll be a great evening. Uh, what we're going to do today is sort of lay out some broad themes of what happens to birds when they land on islands. Uh, and in particular, we're going to open by talking about some of the great radiations that we see in ornithology on islands. Islands, of course, are this crucible of evolution, and it's really on islands where we see the most dramatic and extreme uh, expressions of natural selection. We'll talk a little bit about the island syndrome. What sorts of changes do we see in the life history and ecology of birds once they land on islands? It turns out that there's some very interesting and sometimes very predictable changes that occur when uh, uh, birds colonize uh, islands. In particular, we'll talk about flightlessness and just the extraordinary diversity of birds that have become flightless uh, on various different islands. And we'll talk a little bit about, try to sort of get a laser view on what happens to genetic variation. Uh, when uh, a new uh, propagule ends up on an island, because of course it's genetic variation that's going to be very important for the long-term survival of these new colonists in this new land. So we're going to begin by traveling to the island of New Guinea, and uh, as Jonathan mentioned, this was as was very formative in my early career. I think every ornithologist knows that. New Guinea is really the epicenter of exotic ornithology. And I've been fortunate enough to return there a few times over the years. We're, of course, talking about this uh, island continent, almost, that you see here just above Australia. It's, uh, despite being uh, in size, sort of about the same size as, as the state of California, the island of New Guinea actually contains more species of birds than the entire continent of Australia just below it. And this, of course, is a consequence of its very tropical uh, climate, uh, the fact that it's uh, heavily bisected by big mountains and steep valleys, which, of course, isolate populations. And so it's very much, there are many, many cases, islands within islands on the island of New Guinea. Some of the classic species that we see there include hornbills, these amazing uh, Victoria crowned pigeons. I wish the pigeons in Harvard Square looked like this. <laughs> Great uh, lorikeets and, of course, uh, birds of paradise, which at least in this slide are, are signified by this somewhat muted glossy manucoat. Of course, the birds of paradise are really the canonical example of adaptive radiation uh, in New Guinea. Uh, having proliferated into almost 40 different species, all descended from a common ancestor that lived uh, fairly recently, on the order of about five or six million years ago. I was, I've always been impressed by the way in which local cultures are able to put their local biodiversity to use. And here you see some pictures of a New Guinea Sing Sing, in which very prominently displayed on the heads of these dancers are uh, the feathers of, of birds of paradise and, and several other key New Guinea species. Another interesting interaction between humans and birds that I have seen in New Guinea concerns the farming of eggs. This is the shot on the, uh, one of the Trobrian islands that you saw on that opening uh, slide in which the local village has deliberately cleared an area uh, free of scrub uh, 
so that they can attract these orange-footed scrub fowls, which you see a few of right here. These scrub fowls are a member of a group of birds called megapodes. Megapodes, of course, are famous for their, the fact that they don't actually build a nest and incubate their eggs by sitting on them. Instead, they lay them underground or near some source of heat, whether it's uh, rotting leaves or perhaps a geothermal source. And their eggs are essentially incubated uh, in mounds of sand here. And so they've essentially attracted the megapodes to their village, and they're harvesting their eggs sustainably. It's a really remarkable example of sort of a cooperation between uh, humans and birds. These, these eggs, by the way, are about uh, twice the size of a typical chicken egg, despite the fact that megapodes are uh, broadly a member of the chicken family. Bowerbirds, of course, are a classic, another classic radiation in New Guinea. These are some relatively old pictures I, I took of various kinds of bowers that we see around uh, Australia and New Guinea. We've got avenue bowers, such as that of the satin bowerbird. We have maypole bowers, which are uh, incredibly elaborate structures built around a single maypole. And bowerbirds and birds of paradise are just some of the reasons where I was, that I was uh, drawn to uh, soon after graduating from, from Harvard. Moving to Hawaii, of course, Hawaii is uh, one of the most isolated islands systems uh, on the planet. And of course, in this classic depiction of the radiation of Hawaiian honey creepers by artist Doug Pratt, we can see the amazing diversity of bill types that these species have evolved into. Hawaii is a classic example of a, a high island. Uh, of course, uh, Mauna Kea and Mauna Loa on the big island reach over 13,000 feet. And like the island of New Guinea, this elevation creates a huge array of habitats. Here's some examples of Hawaiian honey creepers that I've encountered over the years. Uh, and it's extraordinary how fragile this avifauna is. Um, many of the species survive only on the highest elevations. Uh, in many cases, uh, avian malaria brought in by interloper uh, bird species from Asia and elsewhere has devastated lowland populations. And really the combination of uh, habitat change brought by Polynesians as well as Europeans and uh, imported diseases has really kept many of these species on the brink. And Galapagos, of course, is another famous place for uh, evolution of uh, diversity on islands. And of course, we'll hear uh, a lot about this in the upcoming talk by uh, Peter and Rosemary Grant, which I'm very much looking forward to. The Galapagos are a very uh, inhospitable place, very dry, arid environments. Humans actually never colonized there. They, uh, uh, they were only naturally colonized by animals and plants. And of course, the star of the Galapagos are, of course, the Darwin's finches that Peter and Rosemary study. I won't spend a lot of time on these except to say that uh, you've seen one Darwin's finch and you've pretty much seen them all. I know, I know Peter, <laughs> Peter would balk at that, but honestly, I can't tell the difference between these species. And it's quite an interesting radiation insofar that some people have suggested that um, hybridization may have taken place and may be partly responsible for why they look so similar. Um, so when I've been able to go to the Galapagos, thankfully with my family, I've looked for much more exotic wildlife like this. <laughs> this is my daughter, Liana. I know she's going to kill me for putting this on the screen. Finally, uh, to finish our tour, uh, Madagascar, of course, is uh, a, an amazing spot for uh, island birds. Notice how close it is to the uh, African mainland. Madagascar displays a very interesting mix of uh, radiations on the one hand and lack of radiations on the other. And so, for example, some of the famous radiations in Madagascar include the Vanga shrikes, this is a, probably the most spectacular radiation on the island um, insofar as these many different build types and ecological niches have evolved from a single common ancestor. Madagascar is distinctive, however, in having some groups of birds which have diverged to the point of becoming separate families. Families, of course, being that rank accorded to 
very disparate groups of birds. And so you have the Azotes and the Mesites, which are found only in Madagascar. They're so-called endemics to Madagascar. Now, it's intriguing that, uh, and I think puts in perspective how much or perhaps how little we know about island evolution. It turns out that molecular studies by uh, my colleague Alice Sibois, who's now in Switzerland, has shown that many groups of birds that were formerly thought to be unrelated to each other, despite their uh, inhabiting the same island of Madagascar, turn out to be related in a common ancestor. And of course, once that relationship has been shown, that immediately elevates this group to another example of uh, adaptive radiation. And so we have lots to discover about avifauna such as Madagascar and other islands around the globe. Now, it's interesting to ask about the extent to which uh, islands harbor endemic species. Remember, end endemism, of course, refers to the fact that those species are found only on those islands. And so I tabulated for a few uh, island groups the percentage of the bird fauna that's found only on that island. Intriguingly, uh, the Galapagos ranks very high, upwards of 80%. Uh, Hawaii, of course, uh, this is sort of pre-human values, uh, ranking very high as well. Other island groups do have their endemic species, such as the Seychelles and the Cape Verde Islands, but they're much more muted in terms of their radiations, perhaps because these islands are relatively low in their relief. Uh, the Seychelles only gets up to a few thousand feet, uh, and possibly because they're very isolated. So that combination uh, of distance and elevation is often what controls how diverse the avifauna is. And this, of course, is the domain of the famous theory of island biogeography, which our own E.O. Wilson here uh, so, uh, so elegantly uh, uh, outlined. Now, the island syndrome is, to me, a fascinating collection of features that a, that happens to birds once they land on an island, often taking place over several million years. We can very clearly document different kinds of changes in body size, and we'll talk a little bit about this island rule and what happens to birds when they land on isolated islands. Very intriguingly, many island species lose all fear of uh, mammals, including humans, especially on islands that don't have any mammalian predators. This loss of fear, of course, is a major reason for the uh, precariousness of many island populations on, uh, on islands today. Many island species uh, evolve to live longer lifespans and smaller clutch sizes. Both of these are part of a syndrome which uh, is, it makes sense if you're essentially not in a hurry to reproduce because you're expecting to be predated on by uh, rats or dogs or cats. Uh, many species tend to extend their lifespan uh, once, uh, when, when the effects of predation are not particularly strong. Frequently their plumage becomes dull, their interesting changes in song, and then of course flightlessness. So let's take a little bit of, of a tour across these different island syndromes. I had uh, a first uh, hand experience of this second item, the loss of fear, when I went to uh, volunteer uh, in the Leeward Hawaiian Islands. This is a remarkable group of islands to the northwest of the main Hawaiian Islands, which you see here. The Leeward Hawaiian, Hawaiian Islands extend another 1,200 miles up uh, towards the uh, uh, Alaskan chain. And of course, at the end of this chain, we have the famous Midway Island of World War II. And as you can see, they're an incredibly fragile collection of very low-lying islands um, atolls and are really uh, the key group that inhabits this uh, island chain are the seabirds. As I mentioned, many of these islands are extremely low lying and so for example this is uh, Turn Island whose maximum elevation is six feet. And so you can imagine uh, what some of the challenges they're facing with climate change and with sea level uh, with sea levels uh, rising. And you may be aware that the, uh, the gr uh, very large tsunami uh, hit this uh, Northwest Hawaiian chain just a few years ago, caused a substantial amount of devastation. Tens of thousands of albatrosses and petrels were killed um, and uh, is just a really graphic illustration of just how fragile these islands are. Uh, 
Well, as a volunteer, I was after data on these birds' eggs, and I'll never forget how uh, this remarkable species, a red-tailed tropic bird, allowed me essentially to lift it, lift, it was incubating an egg. I took my ruler and pried it up, pulled its egg out, measured it, put it back under without it ever flushing. It's a remarkable example of how, uh, now mind you, it did look a little bit perturbed. It's like, well, what's going on here? And, but it, did, it never, never occurred to it to actually fly away. And that's the example of the kind of uh, loss of fear that we see. Now, other seabirds on these islands, such as this red-footed booby, are quite the opposite. And I have scars to prove the fact that they were uh, well aware of my uh, messing with their reproductive success. Now, uh, Hawaii, of course, is famous for the uh, number and diversity of extinct species. And I'm very indebted to my colleague, Helen James, a curator of birds at the Smithsonian, for lending me these next few slides. Uh, Helen James has uh, described a, a remarkable diversity of extinct species that inhabited Hawaii. Many of these species likely succumbed to human predation precisely because of this loss of fear. And uh, within just a few centuries of the Polynesians arriving in Hawaii, um, many of these species were extinct. Here's an example of uh, a moa nalo, a, a, a remarkable flightless uh, goose. Here you can see its uh, skeleton reconstruction, and here's its uh, plumage reconstruction. Many of these fossils are extraordinarily preserved, uh, and Helen has found them uh, deep in crevasses. And here's a depiction of some flightless ibises falling into a crevasse, uh, very well preserved for paleontologists to come centuries later to uh, discover them and describe them. But again, this was the source of demise for only some of the species, and really it was human predation that uh, caused this really sobering decline that we see before extinctions. It's, uh, Helen James estimates that there were upwards of 100 uh, terrestrial birds in the Hawaiian Islands. By the 1800s, that number had been reduced uh, by half. By 2004, uh, the number is only 31. And so you can see we're very much on the brink with these uh, island species. Uh, most of them are uh, endangered. And you will, uh, lots has been written about the plight of conservation efforts in Hawaii, uh, despite this extraordinary uh, disproportionate number of extinct and endangered species, uh, Hawaii receives very few, uh, uh, disproportionately few federal funds for conservation. So there's a lot of issues to be worked out. Let's talk a bit about this island rule. And the island rule is, a, it's, it's a nice uh, summary of uh, many decades of work that was originally very confusing to evolutionary biologists such as myself. And frequently biologists would measure birds on the mainland, they'd go measure birds on a, a closely uh, spaced island, and they might not find any difference in size. This was quite puzzling. And it, it's occurred to colleagues uh, such as Sonia Clegg that there's two processes going on. What biologists tend to find is that large-bodied species tend to become smaller. What you see here is a uh, the size of the uh, species on the mainland, small-bodied and large-bodied. And then you see here the uh, difference in size uh, that occurs once uh, that species has moved to an island. So small-bodied species tend to become larger on islands, whereas large-bodied species tend to become smaller. And so you can see we've got two different processes here pattern likely driven by the availability of niches uh, as these species diverge over time. <clears throat> now, we don't have to go to faraway oceanic islands to observe this island rule in action. Here's an interesting study on the coal tit, which is a very uh, common uh, passerine bird, very closely related to our chickadees here in Massachusetts, where they were able to document uh, several percentage points increase in body size compared to this uh, reference population on the mainland. So what you can see in these graphs here are increases in body size of all of these island populations uh, around this uh, peninsula in Finland. Um, differences that have accumulated, uh, no doubt, over, over centuries, if not millennia, 
but still remarkable that we can detect them uh, on islands so close to the mainland here. Another interesting pattern that we find is, is uh, the, sort of the breadth of uh, body sizes that an island can sustain. And what you see here is a compilation of data by uh, my colleague at Yale, Walter Yetz, who has illustrated the maximum body size of birds occurring on various islands. The maximum are these red dots that you can see occur on the North and South Island of New Zealand, as well as on New Caledonia there, uh, as well as very small body sizes, which you see on some of these very isolated islands. And what uh, Walter suggests is that large islands essentially are able to sustain not only very large species, but also very small species, such that the whole breadth of uh, range of body sizes on big islands tends to be greater than the breadth that we see on small islands. And so um, <clears throat> you can see, for example, this is hopefully the only graph I'll show, but uh, you can see how on, as the island area gets larger, this is a measure of island area in square kilometers, we see increases in body size as well as decreases, a pattern that's even more marked in this panel here, which focuses on flightless birds. And so this involves both studies of extinct uh, as well as extant uh, birds. So uh, this is an interesting way to um, parse out some of the dynamics of evolution on these islands. Now you notice that uh, those red circles around uh, the island of New Zealand, which of course uh, signified the fact that moas, those remarkable flightless birds from New Zealand, uh, were some of the main uh, aspects of the uh, avifauna on that island. New Zealand, and I should say islands in general, were starting to appreciate their remarkable contributions to avian evolution over the long term. So we might ask, why are New Zealand birds so special? One reason is because they harbor these relics, relic species that have dr drifted on New Zealand over many, many millions of years. And they're harboring lineages that are not only special because they're endemic, namely they're found only there, but also because they're genealogically unique. It turns out that New Zealand harbors a number of groups that we call sister groups to uh, other very uh, large groups of birds. And so a sister group essentially means a, a closely related group that is uh, sort of the progenitor, if you will, for the entirety of the rest of the radiation. So this diminutive little songbird called a rifleman, it's found only in New Zealand, it turns out that it forms the deepest branch in the genealogical tree for all of the perching birds, which of course comprises well over half of all avian diversity, uh, upwards of 5,400 species. And it's remarkable to me to think that this diminutive songbird found only in New Zealand is sort of the most ancient relic compared to the rest of the uh, entire radiation. But it doesn't end there. We see a very similar pattern when we look at parrots. And so the kakapo, again endemic to New Zealand, is the sister group to all of the remaining 320 or so species of parrots. Finally, some of the flightless birds in New Zealand, such as the kiwi, again, are the sister not just to a restricted group of birds, but in this case to all the other 10,000 species. So islands like New Zealand are uh, really proving their worth in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the ancestry and the, the, the diversity uh, of the lineages that they harbor. Now, as a geneticist, I'm naturally interested in what happens to birds when they colonize an island. And we can, of course, uh, look at that in a number of different ways, and we can measure the amount of genetic variation that an island population harbors versus uh, the amount uh, in, in a mainland population. And so zebra finches are uh, native to Australia, and I've spent uh, many, many years uh, running around this uh, fascinating continent. And you may know that zebra finches are very widespread all across uh, arid inland Australia. Uh, there are estimates of uh, the number of um, zebra finches uh, done uh, by uh, ecological censuses, and they num the absolute uh, numbers measure in the billions. They're an incredibly small bird, very common, found uh, throughout uh, the continent. 
Turns out there's also uh, an island population of zebra finches on the island of Timor uh, on the southern end of Indonesia. And it was of great interest to ask, how does the genetic diversity of that Timor population compare to the diversity that we might uh, see across um, the uh, continent of Australia? And what we see is a remarkable reduction in diversity of uh, Timor Island uh, finches. And you can see, for example, in these black bars here, this is a measure of the genetic diversity found at about 30 different places in the genome. Each bar represents a different uh, gene, if you will. And intriguingly, in the Timor populations, which are in orange, these are invariably much lower than the amount of diversity in the mainland populations. And for many of these genes, we actually didn't find any diversity at all. And so you can see that in some of these genes, there's absolutely no orange showing at all, meaning there's no diversity at all. This is quite interesting because it says that uh, somehow these birds are persisting uh, in the absence of much of the genetic variation that their mainland counterparts may have had. And it may mean that perhaps there's only a few genes in the genome that are really important for regulating whether or not birds uh, survive or perish in the face of environmental change. Using this data, we were able to reconstruct the evolutionary history of these birds. And what you can see is sort of a timeline here where at a, almost two million years ago, we saw, we estimate that the founding population was relatively small, about 5,000 birds and that it hasn't grown on Timor appreciably uh, uh, up to the present. And again, the continental birds have much more genetic variation. So this uh, study was, I think, useful for figuring out uh, how much genetic variation might be present in island species. But of course, uh, zebra finches, we estimated, colonized Timor you know, several million years ago. So it's not exactly a, a, a snapshot in recent time. We can get some uh, other insights from birds that have spread historically in, in, in historic times to different island groups. And this is again a study by my colleague uh, Sonia Clegg who tracked the genetic diversity of silver eyes. Silver eyes are a small songbird that's uh, common throughout the eastern uh, part of Australia. And it's interesting because it's well known that these birds were introduced to New Zealand and to other islands in the Pacific at known points in time uh, within a relatively uh, recent time frame. And what you can see here is how she was able to track genetic diversity starting from the mainland, which is ML, through these successive introductions to different island groups. And she was able to document a very uh, repeated loss of genetic diversity with each of these introductions to different islands. And so this gives a nice perspective and it suggests that these serial bottlenecks as birds get introduced to different island chains will uh, successively erode their genetic variation. Another uh, way in which we can look at uh, genetic diversity is by looking at introduced species. And uh, this uh, work on house finches is work done by my graduate student, Allison Schultz, who's been interested in the changes in genetic diversity of this uh, common songbird, the house finch, as it was introduced from its uh, native range in the western U.S. and Mexico to two localities in the eastern U.S. on the one hand and to the Hawaiian Islands on the other. We know a lot about when these uh, introductions took place, but we might not know um, as much about how many birds were introduced, and that's where genetics can help us estimate those numbers. Allison found that it was very easy to distinguish the Hawaiian and Eastern populations, which you see here in green and red, from the native Western US population. These bars simply indicate that we can use computer algorithms to readily distinguish uh, these different populations. Quite remarkable considering that these populations have only been separated by uh, a few decades. She was also able to show that the amount of genetic diversity in Hawaii in particular, fell by about 14% compared to the Western US uh, mainland population. In the Eastern US, it was a little less, about 7%. And this, I think, is a nice example allowing us to um, sort of use a, a human-mediated natural experiment 
to try to reconstruct what may have happened naturally to many different groups uh, of birds as they colonized islands. Now, genetic diversity isn't the only thing that's lost as birds uh, colonize islands. For example, song diversity has been well documented in uh, silver eyes as they're moving from island to island. On this axis here, you can see sort of the, the number of syllables in their song, and you can see how that number declines as they're moving, perhaps because there's smaller populations and less of a social context in which to innovate in song. For some species, such as this European chaffinch, it's not so much the diversity of song, but really the structure of the song, which becomes much reduced and much more chaotic. I've uh, brought for you here some examples of sonograms of this chaffinch from uh, mainland Europe on the one hand. Let's listen to that. Oops. So that's a very common sound throughout uh, Europe uh, in uh, uh, rural areas. That's from the mainland Europe. And now we can ask what they sound like in the uh, Canary Islands, OK? Oops. So you can hear there's quite a bit of difference. And although they found that the actual, as you sum up over all these phrases that the canary birds are singing, they actually retain most of the syllables that their mainland counterparts had. What's different is the structure of their songs, which this graph attempts to show how mainland birds in blue have lots of repeatability and structure, whereas these island birds in red tend to lose their structure, have a more random approach. <clears throat> now, this issue of diversity isn't one that just applies to birds or other kinds of animals. Of course, humans are also subject to these losses of diversity. And as many of you know, human genetics is experiencing a renaissance right now as we can look at all of the genes across the genome. And what you can see here is the steady erosion of genetic diversity as we move from Africa, which of course is our ancestral home and which has the highest diversity of all populations on the planet, to island uh, populations in Melanesia and Polynesia who have uh, significant declines in the amount of genetic diversity. This of course has a lot of implications for uh, human disease and medical genetics. And it's intriguing to know that humans, in many ways, operate by many of the same rules uh, as do other uh, species. Now, let's move on to flightlessness, which has become of intense interest to uh, my group in particular in the past few years. Flightlessness is a hallmark of many island species. Uh, we mentioned, for example, the kakapo from New Zealand, the flightless parrot, and of course, the moas of New Zealand are incredible examples of the evolution of flightlessness uh, on different island groups. And across the Pacific, we see a wide range of species and lineages that have become flightless. Uh, even the songbirds, those diminutive songbirds like the riflemen, have become flightless. And uh, it's, it's very rare to see these very small songbirds becoming flightless. One of the key uh, examples of uh, flightless uh, groups are these uh, fairly poorly known uh, mihirungs of Australia. This, of course, are, uh, these are unrelated to the uh, emu and cassowary that live in Australia. Uh, these are studied by my colleague Trevor Worthy at Flinders University. Instead, it's thought that these uh, large flightless species are likely closely related to uh, ducks, believe it or not. They're, they're, they're ducks that have become highly terrestrial and have undergone uh, gigantism. These uh, species are estimated to be five or six times the weight of an adult emu. So emus are small by comparison. Now, as I mentioned, my lab has become quite interested in how these genetic changes uh, might uh, result in the evolution of flightlessness. And we've been able to take advantage of a, a recent discoveries in this particular group of birds known as the paleognath birds. The paleognaths, of course, include a lot of the famous flightless species that you're aware of, such as emus and ostriches, uh, kiwis, and rias of South America. It used to be that this diminutive group here, the tinamous, the tinamous are a 
small group of uh, chicken-sized uh, birds that actually can fly uh, and which live throughout the uh, neotropics uh, in uh, Central and South America. It used to be that tinamous were thought to be outside of this entire radiation, such that we could invoke a single loss of flight in the common ancestor of all of these flightless groups. Okay? That was a very convenient, uh, simple scenario that evolutionary biologists were comfortable with for decades. Only in the past five or six years have we sort of expanded the range of these studies without constraining tinamous to fall in that uh, basal position. And these studies have shown that, in fact, tinamous are nested deeply within the ratite radiation. This is significant because it immediately calls into question this single loss of flight. We can no longer claim that flight was lost down here at the base unless we're willing to invoke a second origin of flight once tinamous diverged. So you can see we're in a bit uh, between a rock and a hard place. Either flight was lost multiple times or tinamous re-evolved flight. And many biologists, including myself, are probably more comfortable with multiple losses of flight rather than a second origin of flight. This flight is very complicated, involves the coordination of many different aspects of the skeleton and even the brain. And to think that it would re-evolve a second time is uh, not out of the question, but certainly challenges our opinion. So we actually think that flight was lost as many as six different times in this group. And this immediately allows us to exploit this evolutionary phenomenon that we call convergence. Convergence is the multiple losses of a trait in, independently in, in different uh, lineages of a group. And we suspect that not only the extinct moas and elephant bird of Madagascar lost flight independently, but even the kiwis, emus, and cassowaries all lost flight independently. We suspect maybe they actually flew to New Zealand or these other uh, island continents uh, and then only lost flight uh, after arriving there. And so my colleagues in the lab have been uh, madly sequencing the genomes of these uh, remarkable uh, birds. So we're trying to catalog all one and a half billion letters in the chromosomes of these species, adding to existing data to build up a catalog of all the genetic changes that have taken place uh, in these flightless groups, as well as in the, um, the flighted tinamous for comparison. We even have uh, inherited a uh, pretty good quality genome from our colleagues uh, in Toronto. Uh, sadly, Alan Baker passed away, but uh, he had created a really remarkable resource in the draft genome of this little bush moa, an example of the moas from New Zealand. So my colleague, uh, Tim Sackton, has created a remarkable database aligning not only these 10 genomes together, but about 42 different species. And we can now go to our computers and simply dial up any gene we want uh, to look for evolutionary changes. And what you see here are in blue are these regions that are similar to whatever species we're comparing to at the top. I believe it's an emu. And the red are points in the genome which are different from the emu reference sequence at the top. And we can use this, uh, we can exploit this uh, convergence in flightlessness to try to pinpoint regions of the genome that may have contributed to this trait. Where are we going to look for these places in the genome? We're going to take a cue from a famous population geneticist named Mutu Kimura, who is responsible for much of our modern understanding of how genes change in populations. And one of his uh, principles, if you will, was that he pointed out that regions of the genome that are functionally less important tend to accelerate or relax uh, once their function has been lost. We can think of it like this. Genes are, that are very important tend to stay the same. They don't change very quickly. There are many more ways to break a gene than to make a new one. And so genes that are very important and are performing an important function tend to be very conserved between different species. If we look for regions of the genome that are accelerating, that are speeding up 
in various lineages, uh, we might be looking, we might be able to find regions that have, whose function has been lost with the result that they are sort of relaxed in their evolution and tend to evolve at a very rapid rate. And here's an example of one such region where you can see in all of these birds that fly, we see lots and lots of blue. That means they're very, very similar. This region of, it's about 250 DNA letters long. You can see, however, in the flightless birds that there's quite a lot of evolutionary change. This is one clue that this region may have been important in the evolution of flightlessness. You can see the uh, flightless rat tights towards the top and the flying birds, including the tinamous, at the bottom. And just to show you the power of this approach, we can ask how many regions of the genome do we find depending on how many lineages that are evolving convergently. So for example, we find about 15,000 regions of the genome that have changed in the ancestor of a cluster of flightless birds, but one where flightlessness was lost only once. So that's quite a lot, that's quite a large number of regions. It doesn't really help us very much in terms of pinpointing these specific areas. When we look at regions of the genome that have uh, relaxed or accelerated on two different lineages, that number suddenly plummets to 480. Now we're getting to uh, a number uh, that is tractable for actual experimental confirmation. When we look at the number that evolves convergently on three different lineages, that number is down to only 45 regions of the genome out of one and a half billion letters. Truly uh, remarkable. Finally, we can ask how many regions are present, are changing in parallel on four different flightless regions. Remarkably, only three regions of the genome are uh, undergoing that type of evolution. You can see how powerful this approach of convergence is, uh, allowing us to take a very large, complex uh, set of uh, chromosomes and winnow down to just a few uh, small regions. Well, I'd like to end by uh, illustrating for you a really remarkable uh, example of uh, the use of genetics in conservation. And of course, that's one of the, the primary functions we'd like to, uh, I think learning about the basic biology is extremely important, but we'd like it to also have some practical consequences. And this uh, brings us again to the island of New Zealand where this black robin remarkably went through a bottleneck of not just a few individuals, but two individuals. In the late 1970s, biologists became aware that this bird was on the brink of extinction uh, with only two individuals left, fortunately a male and a female. So that's, uh, that's, that's, that's good, but still very, very precarious. It turned out that uh, conservation efforts helped to rescue this species, increase its numbers, but there was a relatively high incidence of an, a maladaptive behavior known as rim laying. Rim laying occurs when the bird doesn't lay its egg in the center of its nest, but rather lays it on the rim, with the result that it's not incubated properly and will most likely die. Now, if you were a conservation biologist in the field, what would you do if you found these rim eggs? <laughs> well, naturally, you'd move them back to the center, right? In the hopes that the bird might incubate them and uh, raise those chicks that would otherwise uh, uh, succumb. It turns out that this uh, bird has a genetic profile that made that a bad strategy. First of all, it was highly inbred. You can see from this genealogy, here are two founding male and female here. There's quite a lot of cases of inbreeding, as you would expect for a population that was only two birds large. Here are three instances here where this male uh, bred with one of its daughters in order to create a new, new chicks here, new chicks here, and here's a breeding attempt with one of the granddaughters here. Again, um, not many choices when the population size is so small, and it's remarkable that they were able to survive this uh, very intense bottleneck. Now, if you look at the incidence of this rim laying, you can see here uh, we've got a couple graphs here. One is in red here showing the uh, number of females that are uh, laying eggs on, on the rim. Uh, the blue is the number of actual rim eggs. You can see that that number is increasing, increasing precisely because conservationists had been moving those eggs to the center of the nest. 
They were essentially allowing this maladaptive behavior that natural selection would naturally have weeded out to survive. And so you can see what a dilemma this was. And it was really only after detailed genetic study and consultation with statisticians and geneticists that the practice of uh, removing, uh, putting the eggs uh, in the uh, center of the nest was stopped. And remarkably, the incidence of rim laying declined immediately. Uh, and the population uh, is, is, is doing uh, relatively well. Um, the, the maladaptive trait is not gone. It's still in the population. But now that we understand how it's inherited, we can take a much more uh, nuanced approach to the conservation of the species. Well, I hope I've given you uh, an overview of some of the amazing things that happen to birds when they land on islands and some of the ways in which we can probe uh, their chromosomes to see how these changes are taking place. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.